So welcome and welcome back to all of you to here to our training session in the St. Helmer Museum. I also want to extend a warm welcome to all of those who are following us online. I know it's Friday afternoon and we had uh, already very long and intense discussions over the last one and a half days, so I hope you're not too tired. But I'm very confident that the topic we're discussing now, the role of civil society in the promotion of human rights in business, and especially the two speakers we have here, will easily attract your attention. And my name is Katharina Häusler. I'm a researcher at the Ludwig Boltzmann Institute of Human Rights in Vienna. And next to me are Mary Lynn Kroeser, the director of the Core Coalition. And on the other side, Patricia Feeney, who is the director of Rights and Accountability in Development. So we have for this panel about one hour, one hour and a half. And we will first hear the perspective from our two experts. And in between and afterwards, you're very much encouraged to ask questions. And of course, speakers can also ask the other one. And so we hope to have a very interesting discussion. And without further ado, I want to introduce you to Marilyn Kroeser, who has been the director of CORE since 2012. Prior to joining CORE, Marilyn led the British Refugee Council's parliamentary work for two years. And from 2005 to 2009, Marilyn worked for Oxfam, where she was part of the international team that coordinated the successful campaign for the Global Arms Trade Treaty. So please, Marilyn, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and <clears throat> excuse me, thank you to the project for the invitation to come and speak to you this afternoon. Uh, I'm going to talk about the UK National Action Plan on Business and Human Rights. Um, I'll just briefly introduce you first to my organisation. Um, then we'll talk about uh, what happened in the UK around the development of the action plan how we and other civil society organisations participated in that, uh, what's happened since the action plan was published and what we've learnt from the process. So CORE stands for the Corporate Responsibility Coalition and it's the UK Civil Society Network on Corporate Accountability. It's a coalition of development, human rights and environmental NGOs and we also have some trade union members. And they all either work on directly themselves or they have an interest in international corporate accountability. So how UK businesses have an impact on people and the planet beyond the UK. Our priorities are corporate governance, in particular uh, transparency and access to justice for people who have been adversely affected by UK corporate activity. We work very closely with the European Coalition on Corporate Accountability, which is the European Coalition for Corporate Justice, and also with the International Corporate Accountability Roundtable in the US. And with them, we've produced reports on access to remedy, uh, and more recently, some work assessing national action plans produced to date. So, uh, to turn then to the UK National Action Plan on Business and Human Rights, as people have discussed and you're all aware, the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights were endorsed by governments at the UN Human Rights Council in 2011, in June, and in November 2011, the UK Prime Minister announced that the United Kingdom would implement the Guiding Principles and would develop an action plan. The UK was the first country to develop a national action plan. Uh, there are now several others uh, from uh, the Netherlands, Denmark and Finland. And plans are in development in Spain. The draft is available. Uh, Germany, uh, they're just beginning the process and also in Ireland. Among a number of other countries, the US have started the process as well. So, it's kind of growing body of documents, these action plans. So the UK plan, the development began in early 2012 and it was led by the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. So it very much had an overseas perspective from the beginning. Uh, there was no baseline assessment 
so there was no uh, assessment of how uh, companies were having impacts, what those impacts were, what the regulatory framework was, was it adequate, was it inadequate, where were there gaps. As far as we were aware, there was no process like that. What happened was a series of workshops with business and civil society, which included NGOs and trade unions. Uh, it did not include people from countries where UK businesses have a major presence. So people you know, on the ground were not uh, consulted, although organisations working with those people were. Uh, and there was very limited involvement of NGOs who might have concerns about domestic human rights impacts. For, for instance, uh, perhaps people who are working with uh, refugees or people seeking asylum. Uh, immigration detention is something that is provided by uh, private firms in the UK. Uh, accommodation services for refugees and people seeking asylum is also provided by private operators. But to my knowledge, those groups and other, other groups like that were not involved in the process. So these workshops happened. There was quite open discussion. You know, a number of issues were put on the table. I think there was a high level of expectation about what the plan would deliver and about what it could include. Uh, initial drafts of the plan were then shared with uh, a small group of organisations and there was some chance to comment, but there was not a wider follow-up consultation. So, you know, there was kind of these one-off workshops, everyone got to say their piece, I think people were uh, quite hopeful that something useful would come out, and then that was it, really, until the, the plan was published. Um, so the plan appeared in... Uh, September 2014, it was launched at a high-level event at the Institute of Directors uh, by the Foreign Secretary and uh, the Business Secretary. Um, the plan is, uh, if you haven't read it, it is, it is available. It's quite short, uh, there's not, not a great deal of detail in there. It's framed very much from the business case. So uh, the perspective emphasises that respect for human rights can bring business benefits, which is fine. But you, I don't think anyone would have a problem with that. But uh, for us, as civil society organisations, that is not the primary purpose of a national action plan on business human rights. It's not to make a business case. It's to set out what the state will do to ensure that human rights are protected uh, in the context of business activities. So I think that framing was not very helpful. The plan follows the three pillar structure of the UNGPs, the state duty to protect human rights, the business responsibility to respect human rights and access to remedy. So I'll just take you through uh, just, just key points from the detail. So, Pillar one, uh, the plan mainly lists actions that had already been taken before it was produced. So it lists a number of legal instruments that had been amended or created relating to bribery, labour standards, transparency, uh, and then a, a longer list of voluntary initiatives that the UK had endorsed or promoted at the international level. So the new action plans in pillar one, which is the state duty to protect human rights, are also primarily voluntary approaches. As you perhaps know, the UN guiding principles emphasize the need for the, the smart mix between voluntary and regulatory approaches. For us, the idea of the smart mix seems to have been somewhat forgotten about and we just go for the voluntary. However, there are three significant commitments in the, in the first section of the plan. So the first was to 
review the degree to which the activities of UK state-owned, controlled or supported, supported enterprises are executed with respect for human rights and make recommendations to ensure compliance with the GPs. The second commitment relates to investment agreements. So it says that the government will ensure that agreements facilitating investment overseas by UK or EU companies incorporate the, the business responsibility to respect human rights and do not undermine the host country's ability to meet its international human rights obligations or to impose the same environmental and social regulation on foreign investors as it does on domestic firms. Uh, and the third uh, commitment, instruct embassies and high commissions to support human rights defenders working on issues related to business and human rights. Um, I'll, come to, I'll come to the implementation in a, in a moment. I'm, I'm not going to deal with Pillar 2. Pillar 2 relates to the business responsibility to respect human rights. So it's, it's largely, again, as you would expect, deals with voluntary approaches, which is, which is fine. Those approaches can have value, um, but solely they are not sufficient in delivering on the state duty to protect human rights. So uh, the remedy section in the plan is very short. It's just one page and a half. All it really says is we will review the provision of access to remedy in the UK. That's essentially it. And Tricia is going to say more about access to remedy, so I'll, I'll leave that. Just turning then to implementation of the plan. So the plan came out with fairly big fanfare. Uh, so what happened since then? It's important to understand the context uh, in the UK. So uh, like everyone else, we have felt the fire of the uh, financial crisis. And the government response to that has been that uh, we must pursue business-led growth. That is what will, according to our government, deliver economic recovery. And to facilitate that growth, regulations must be removed where they are holding business back. So a very powerful and consistent deregulation narrative developed. So regulation is red tape, uh, it places hurdles in the way of doing business, it's not helpful and it must be got rid of. So that's, that's, the, you know, that's the context in which this plan was implemented. So immediately from the beginning it's, it's not particularly auspicious. Um, I think that made it very difficult for the people charged with producing the plan and the officials who hold this agenda to secure buy-in from other government departments. And you can really see that, and we have seen that in our engagement with officials. So although there is a cross-departmental steering group, um, the people involved were fairly... They weren't high-level. Um, and there's been very limited involvement from other departments who were key to the UK's implementation of the guiding principles. So the Department for International Development, the Ministry of Justice, the Home Office, they have pretty much been absent from some of the debates. The Department for Business more recently have been a little more engaged, but we haven't seen the policy coherence that again is emphasized in the guiding principles. In the plan, there is no timetable for implementation. There are very few uh, specific goals. So I picked a few highlights out. <clears throat> but there's nothing in there saying how. You know, it's very much, well, this is what we'll do. But beyond that, there's no detail on how we intend to do it. Uh, there, were no, there was no named department that had responsibility. And where we are now is very little has actually happened except for government claiming uh, after the event 
uh, that certain things that they've done uh, are all part of the business and human rights agenda. So, uh, for instance, we've had the uh, passage through at EU level of the, of the Directive on Non-Financial Reporting, which will require companies to report on social human rights and environmental impacts. We already had a provision like that in UK law, it, but the EU directive will extend that to large company supply chains. Now, the UK government, since that uh, passed, has said, ah, here is an example of an action that we have taken on business and human rights, despite the fact that they opposed that absolutely throughout the negotiations. So it's very nice that they're now claiming it and embracing it, but really, you know, it's, uh, it's stretching it, it's, you know, stretching the uh, business and human rights elastic as far as it will go. So for, for civil society in the UK and to share the learning with uh, people here as you perhaps engage with the development of the Spanish action plan, uh, I think we should have tried from the beginning to engage with more than the lead department on the plan. So, you know, the foreign office was leading the work, we engaged with them, but we, I think, should have scrutinised other departments at that stage and said to them, how are you involved in the development of this plan? Do you have a departmental position? How will you take forward some of the actions? Um, I think perhaps we should have tried to do a little bit more to set the agenda, um, but then the, you know, the process was quite new, it was, it was unfamiliar. There is a review of the plan, which will begin this year, and we're preparing to engage with that. Uh, and there are also now a number of assessments of the UK plan and the other existing national action plans that have been completed. So there's already a greater level of scrutiny, both about the process of preparing the plan and the type of content that it should include. Uh, and finally, we have an election in the UK in May. Uh, it's completely open. No one really knows what way it will go. Uh, but uh, we are obviously hoping that it will deliver uh, a more helpful context for work on business and human rights. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marilyn, for this really insightful, very lively presentation. Uh, I will now hand over to Patricia Feeney. Patricia is the Executive Director of Rights and Accountability in Development, an Oxford-based NGO. Uh, in addition to that, Patricia has been a member of the steering board for the UK's national contact point for the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises, and she's also a member of the board of the Association of the International Code of Contact for Private Security Service Providers. She's also the author of numerous reports and publications, and including Accountability Aid, and please, the floor is yours. Well, thanks very much, and, and thank you to the organizers for what is the debate de nos jours. It really is, um, I think, where um, attention is most focused and um, one of the areas that most cries out for development and creative thinking, some of which we've already heard from previous speakers. Um, I want to discuss uh, non-judicial uh, mechanisms, grievance mechanisms, some of which, again, we've already heard a bit about uh, from previous speakers. Um, and I'll focus mainly on the corporate level grievance mechanisms, which have been very much pushed and promoted through national action plans and the UN guiding principles. And I see it as part of the draft uh, Spanish one of the recommendations for the draft um, Spanish National Action Plan, um, Medida 36. Um, I would just say, hold, hold your horses a bit on that one. I'll, I'll give my presentation and then we can discuss. Uh, I'll, I will, because I've been very heavily involved um, since the 2000, uh, 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 in the year 2000, the revision of the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises. Um, uh, and since that time, you know, have participated in presenting 
uh, complaints to various NCPs, not just um, the national contact points, the NCPs in my own country, um, but in various jurisdictions, maybe about 14, just to sort of partly to test it. Um, uh, and so, and I was one of the founders of the network OECD Watch, which uh, continues to do great work in, in comparing and contrasting uh, the activities of national contact points. So RAID has been working in this area since about 1998. Uh, we seek redress for victims of corporate-related abuse, and that may take the form of trying uh, you know, criminal <laughs> cases, tort actions, um, administrative actions using the stock market regulatory frameworks, um, as well as um, the soft law mechanisms such as the OECD guidelines. And we've found it amazingly difficult to get very far in any of these avenues, although, as, as Katerine reminded us, you know, it's push, it, all of these actions are pushing forward the debate. So we've been involved in looking at um, the arms for minerals or um, uh, military support for mineral swap that was a feature of the uh, con uh, conflict in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, and that left a legacy of unexplained uh, ownership of, of, of lucrative uh, copper and cobalt and coltan mines, which eventually led um, for uh, a re-negotiation um, uh, of, of many um, mining contracts in the Congo, but it was a very unsatisfactory process. We've looked at the weak oversight and the, um, the comparative ease for companies with uh, assets, either no assets or assets of very dubious provenance and with um, unclear beneficial owners to be able to list uh, in London, which is you know financial capital, which you'd think would have quite strict rules, uh, and looking at the conflict of interest between those who sponsor these companies onto the market, um, uh, and the fact that they also benefit from the companies um, uh, and, and have an interest, and, and that conflict is, is one of the problems of the oversight issue. And as I said earlier, when I intervened, we've been involved in the responsible mineral supply chain. Um, so, uh, just, you probably all know about the OECD guidelines, the dispute resolution mechanism, very low threshold for presenting claims. You don't have to be an affected party. So in many ways, it's very attractive um, for uh, NGOs with limited means um, to sort of call their government's attention to a problem and seek that kind of help that they are obliged and supposed to provide. Uh, and it's been a pretty uphill struggle uh, with one or two exceptions, probably the leading national contact point for you know, well-reasoned, um, balanced uh, outcomes, because all you get is, is a statement. But of course, we know that even that can be very powerful in the commercial um, context, um, uh, is the Norwegian national contact point. Uh, the UK was doing quite well until a few years ago, but now I think it sort of slipped. We had a change of team, and I think this whole idea of, um, uh, of not undermining the competitive advantage of your own uh, companies is pulling, you know, you have that pull-back factor as well as the push factor, um, and so it's never sort of a, a done deal. Uh, I don't think there have been that many cases in Spain. I think there's maybe been one or two union cases brought to the Spanish national contact point. Um, but Spanish NGOs on the whole don't seem to have um, been inspired to try, I mean, to, to make this mechanism work. And maybe that's an area for, Span for Spain and Spanish uh, groups to sort of explore more. Um, because even when you fail, the idea is you fail better next time <laughs> and hope to make progress in that way. 
Uh, John Ruggie was quite uh, outspoken about the limited uh, impact of national contact points. And as Catherine was saying, you know, their, their lack of expertise in how to handle a complaint, their lack of training and skills as mediators, and yet the main focus is on mediation. Um, their lack, because they're often uh, officials in the inv investment part of the uh, finance ministries, um, they, know, they don't know the right areas of international law, so the issues that we were discussing in the previous session, you know, what kind of expertise do you need for these kinds of complex cases that um, are emerging through globalization. So since 2001, we've had about 200 NGO complaints filed across a number of uh, uh, national contact points and there have been about 160 trade union cases, which we've been able to document. Um, and only about a third of them have uh, reached a kind of, some sort of outcome, maybe a, medi uh, a mediated uh, solution of sorts, um, or uh, a final statement where there's been some sort of rep reprimand, is the most you can hope for, um, or recommendation. Um, uh, so it's not exactly the floodgates that Ruggy was always warning us about <laughs> once we moved into this area. Um, and the common faults here, is, uh, as I said, and the perception at least of a pro-business bias. And I think in some countries where the national contact point just refuses to register complaints, uh, let alone actually examine them, uh, there are many examples of that. Uh, and I think what you need, if you're only going to have a statement um, that has a power, uh, we know it's, it's not a, a judgment, um, then they need to be grounded, they need to be reasoned, the, the evidence does need to be assessed, and very few national contact points at the moment, including our own, are, are producing uh, final statements of, of any use or quality. And then I think uh, the costs, although it's nothing compared to real law, the, co the costs are not negligible in pursuing a, a drawn-out um, mediation. So with the, um, the guiding principles, we, obviously that it's produced a lot of clarity and it's given uh, a way forward from a kind of a stalemate that we had with the, uh, the UN norms. Um, but I think it has, uh, our concern is that it has rather ushered in a managerial response to corporate related human rights violations. And in the worst instances, it's being reduced to a communication issue. Um, how do you manage the problem rather than how do you tackle a violation, have it acknowledged, and, and ensure that you have some deterrence so it doesn't happen again, as well as getting a remedy. And we don't have all those components in, in place. Um, I would think that um, if you don't properly identify what the abuse is <laughs> and have some authoritative judicial body or authoritative ombudsman figure ascertaining exactly who or uh, which entity is responsible for these quite complex, in, in most cases, human rights abuses um, that often involve uh, the public law enforcement office, uh, officials of um, countries like Congo or Tanzania, and yet the degree uh, or otherwise of, of complicity of, of the companies that keep using these same <laughs> gun-happy public forces to guard their mines or, or their oil installations or whatever, can we just sort of accept that that's okay, that they can go on doing it and wash their hands of any responsibility? And NGO reports and others keep presenting this problem into the realm of uh, public domain, and answer comes the none. And um, you know, I think that that is the problem. That you know, so and what is happening is that it's being pushed back down into this. I 
uh, mechanism, the idea of a mediation between consenting parties where you have a dispute uh, that can be uh, uh, resolved at that kind of uh, level between the community. Often uh, the community has no access to independent legal advice. They may have, if they're lucky, a local NGO, but they may not be the most sophisticated, well-informed operators, and they have limitations. Uh, and you've got the whole power of the corporate entity <laughs> bearing down on, on, on that. And, um, uh, and so it's kind of um, a very good option for powerful companies. It's a much less positive outcome uh, for the communities, but I think more important for shaping and helping us go forward in this debate about you know, unpicking which any kind of legal system has to do. Uh, you know, what are the responsibilities? Where do you draw the line? Where, what do we mean can, um, where, where is requisitioning company um, equipment, uh, the use of planes, uh, drivers, uh, vehicles, um, all those, that logistical kind of help. Where do you draw the line? Um, and we haven't really had uh, that properly analysed, you know, through these uh, mechanisms at all. And we won't, of course, either through the tort law cases, because most of them, uh, as the recent um, uh, African mining gold uh, case in Tanzania showed, um, we ha it's an out-of-court settlement, so there's a kind of uh, blanket uh, over it. Now... Why I'm concerned about company-level grievance mechanisms, we only really have um, two main uh, examples of uh, company uh, uh, operational-level grievance mechanisms, both really from the same uh, Canadian parent company, Barrick Gold. Um, the first one was in Papua New Guinea at the Porgera mine, um, which had had a history of um, uh, violence, is sprawling, Mines that uh, were, you know where people had been sort of uh, going on site collecting minerals, um, you know having clashes with security force, ending up you know with deaths, women being raped on a fairly uh, routine basis, um, and for years sort of blanket denial by by the the company, the joint venture, um, and uh, eventually Barrick in 2010 joined the Voluntary Principles, uh, a multi-stakeholder initiative, and started to try and improve its, um, uh, well, I think its human rights performance and it, the per perception of its human rights performance. And so it set up a grievance, a remedy program, they called it, to deal with outstanding uh, human rights abuses claims uh, against their security guards. And the, they the idea of bringing claims involving the Papua New Guinean um, police was left to one side. So this was um, a kind of no-fault um, uh, way of dealing with uh, these cases that, that wouldn't go away. And so again, you had very um, low entry uh, threshold into the mechanism, you have, um, but you, there wasn't really independent um, uh, legal advice, and the crucial thing with this remedy and the one in Tanzania is that in order to participate in the program, you had to sign a legal waiver, um, uh, waiving your rights to bring any future claim in any jurisdiction against Barrick or any entity related to Barrick in, in the future. Uh, and so, because of the lack of transparency and oversight, uh, there was no means of assessing whether the, the recompense actually was appropriate to the harm that these individuals had suffered. And of course, on the other side, you could say, well, because there hasn't been a, um, you know, the criminal process and we haven't had to establish to a criminal degree um, that harm actually occurred in that way, it's a kind of a quid pro quo. But it's incredibly unsatisfactory. Um, and it's quite clear that in some cases, um, the amount of compensation 
uh, that has been offered uh, to some of these victims is, is not appropriate, is not adequate for the long-term harms. The case in Tanzania, I think, is even more um, troublesome. It's similar. Here it's a, this is a, a leaflet that African Barrack Gold assured us was widely posted up all over the villages surrounding the mine, uh, their North Mara mine in Tanzania, which is near the Kenyan border. Uh, and it, the lady is saying, uh, uh, hey, I've got a problem. And he says, no, you haven't. Just go along to the complaints office and they'll see you right. And it's all very jolly. <laughs> and she ends up with what looks like a, an envelope with a check in it or something like that. And anyway, we spent June and July trudging around all these villages in Tanzania. Uh, no, and we took this leaflet with us. Nobody in Tanzania <laughs> in these villages had even seen it. Not even the, the people in the mine <laughs> had ever seen it. We went to talk to uh, the, the mine uh, officials uh, while we were there, and they looked somewhat embarrassed. So, you know, it... You know, maybe it's being sh distributed now, but it was very much, um, you know, rear guard defense. They were kind of getting bad publicity. They introduced this program very hastily. Um, it didn't have some of the safeguards that the, um, the operation had in uh, Papua New Guinea. Um, the only advice that the uh, people who were coming into the program got was from a former Tanzanian High Court judge who, who uh, was supposed to explain to the individuals what was in the documents they were signing, because many of them obviously are literate. The initial wave of people who were signed on um, had to sign documents that were only in English, so there was sort of double barrier. Um, and they didn't know. Some of them, many of them, were deliberately targeted, we believe, because they were claimants in the lawsuit in the UK. So it was quite a cynical exercise to try and um, undermine the case in, in the UK. So the UK lawsuit, lawsuit started in March 2013 uh, with about 33 potential claimants. Um, they notified African Barrett Gold this process started, and by the time they actually filed the complaint, the, the, it, the number of uh, claimants had dropped to 13, and then the, they'd been whittled down even more over the course of the year, uh, so that finally uh, there was an out-of-court settlement announced just a, few, a week or so, where we had nine cli claimants left. And yet the number of people who've had life-changing, really terrible injuries, uh, there have been fatalities, uh, or in a kind of loss of limbs, uh, kind of legs blown off, um, because they, they go into the mine uh, and try and pick up waste rock. The more adventurous youths sort of get into the pit. And the external um, security is the Tanzanian police, but it's not the ordinary police, it's a special riot sort of, uh, with a, a riot brigade, which has, you know, sort of special powers, and they're armed with these machine guns, and they're sort of, you know, they're just sort of like taking, you know, like clay pigeon shooting. Uh, so it is, and at the same time, they're involved in and colluding and letting the miners in, you know, they bribe a bit and they get a bit, they get 10 minutes in the area and then they have to go. Um, and then they start firing if the supervisors come. So how can you say that a situation that's been going on like that for five or six years is in any way suitable for this kind of mechanism? Or that it should be an excuse for a company, uh, a major and publicly listed company, to say, oh, it's nothing to do with us. We don't control the, the, the public uh, police, you know. Um, uh, and, I mean, even worse in some ways, given what Mar Marilyn's just been saying, you know, for the British government to be saying, oh, we're going to uh, give a talk on the voluntary principles. Um, to the Tanzanian authorities and get them to join the voluntary principles. And, 
you, you kind of get these parallel systems. So we already have international law, we already have treaty bodies. So why do we want this lesser thing that's private? I mean, the voluntary principles have existed for 20 years or more. They still haven't set up a complaints mechanism. They publish nothing um, uh, about you know, uh, how much violence has diminished or increased. Um, so we only have their word for it, that think that they're, they're contributing to improving standards. Um, because it's totally opaque, um, and, and that's why most of the leading human rights NGOs are just not participating in it. So um, I think, uh, I'll, I'll probably end there, but I think uh, we, we seem to be moving away from publicly, you know, from public law, from publicly accountable mechanisms, from determination of, of human rights, um, handing it over to... Uh, I, I think illegitimate private um, schemes that have no accountability, and you know, so it's not that there isn't a role for that, for, but we have to be very careful what kinds of complaints and issues are suitable for a company level uh, operation. What kinds of issues could go towards the NCPs and and use the mediation and hopefully you know, better informed than we've got at the moment, and what sort of cases might go to the kind of arbitration that we heard from. Um, but I think at the moment, the, there's a downward pressure, you know, to turn everything into a sort of tussle between NGOs and the communities on one side and companies on the other and the comp uh, governments withdrawing. Okay, thank you. So thanks also to you, Patricia, for your very interesting presentation. And now I want to give the floor to you. Are there are any questions to one of our speakers? Not yet. So I will start. Um, the last thing you said about um, handing justice over to um, to sort of private institutions deciding actually themselves in a way that's uh, how they are handling it or not handling it. And the clause you talked before um, uh, about in, in Papua New, New Guinea mm -hmm. that they actually had to, to sign a clause where they, for all the future things that might happen, they, they would exclude going to the courts. This is, I think, something like this these are the main problems we have to face because um, it really contradicts the way of how we see the state and how we see justice. Mm. If you decide yourselves that for a certain issue you are going to contract with somebody else, um, you exclude justice. This is a way in which really goes against the idea of, of state and public judicial order. And on the other hand, you have this conflicting interest that you have in, for intra-business uh, relations, you have for way long already this tradition of, of arbitration mm -hmm. and where you, it is accepted that you could do this. And in my opinion, this is really something which has to be made clear. Uh, and this is something, I mean, we in our research probably make that clear, but it is something which states have to make clear, and it is their duty to, to draw this line until which point you can decide to handle something outside courts. So this can be maybe for minor things, for contractual disputes, but there has to be a line where you say, no, this is something where at least you have to address the court, and then maybe within the court you have to it, there, there will be a possibility to handle it via mediation or whatever, but uh, this is, in my opinion, something where the state has a clear role in, in also um, taking its own role seriously to, to, um, yeah, to handle justice and its territory and maybe beyond. So this was... Uh, no, I think it's quite... Troubling, and I think you know the way that this came into the um, the idea of operational grievance mechanisms was pushed into the um, 
uh, the final penultimate versions of, of the guiding principles with before they'd even done, you know, these five pilots hadn't even finished. And these pilots were quite, you know, they were selected um, by the rugby team. Um, they didn't involve, you know, discussions with the victims. It was only, uh, or uh, uh, NGOs or unions, as far as I can see. It was very much sort of top down. Um, uh, and yet on this very flimsy basis, but using this idea of it's a pragmatic approach, um, this is being rolled out um, uh, not only uh, in the guiding principles, but through the national action plans uh, and, and very heavily promoted, and yet without these sort of, well, you know, these safeguards about, well, it's suitable for this kind of level and not for that. And I've just stepped down from the board of the International Code of Conduct for private military security companies because, you know, I mean, again, you might think, well, for certain kinds of problems, uh, that company level grievance mechanism might be okay, but they pushed it into that as well. Um, uh, and I think all of us, I mean, we, you know, think of Nissau Square, <laughs> think of, you know, they're going around, these guys are going around armed, they're, they're supposed to be only in defensive um, situations, but there's a thin line between defensive and offensive. Um, and then we're going to say it's, that they should be the ones setting up a mechanism to deal with. I mean, it's just so fantastical and ridiculous that I think all of us as the human rights community <laughs> you know, need to stand up and tell governments, wait a minute, that's way too far, or much too fast, let's, let's get it working. Because whenever it was presented by John Ruggie in the you know, discussions, it was all, you know, we need this to stop pro small problems escalating into human rights abuses, which nobody disagrees with. You know, so he uh, always said it's, you know, about running over a chicken and, and you could quickly deal with that instead of letting these grievances build up. But this is way beyond that. And here we have, you know, rape. I mean, these are international, well, these are certainly crimes and some of them may arguably, um, you know, reach the level of international crimes, thinking of some of the cases in the Congo. So it's totally a no-no area and we do need, I think, um, you know, much more attention focused on it and, and a break put on this um, while allowing, you know, some of the innovative ideas to go forward, but, you know, in a more limited sphere. Uh, yeah, just briefly to add, I mean, Tricia brought it out in her presentation, but in your remarks, you referred to it. What we're seeing is a, you know, a privatization of standards, and here a privatization of justice, which is very deeply disturbing when you consider the seriousness of the violations. And it, you know, as we've discussed, it's just it's completely inappropriate. I mean, for us, there's the question of what is in that situation where you have a UK headquartered company and these incidents are happening in at one of their sites, what should the UK regulatory response be? What is the appropriate regulatory response? And the response of the UK government to this uh, case has been Minimal. I mean, it has been, or we'll have a word with the Tanzanian government about the voluntary principles. Really, as far as, as far as we're aware, you know, nothing further. Now, just to give a, an example, I was reading yesterday about uh, a flood that had occurred a few years ago at uh, a Welsh mine uh, where four people were killed, four, four workers. Now, as a response to that, there was an investigation, a health and safety investigation, and then there was a criminal prosecution. Now, in the end, the criminal prosecution uh, didn't result in a guilty verdict, but still there was a judicial process, it was investigated, it was looked into, and, you know, re really, you, we need to get to a point where there's a much greater clarification of the standards of conduct 
to which UK companies should adhere overseas? And then what is the role of the UK government in making sure that companies are behaving appropriately? And then for us, this case is just a, a, such a powerful example of why access to justice in the UK is so vital. So, that, you know, as Tricia said, there were some, there were claims, but in a situation where a, a state actor, in this case the Tanzanian police, is involved in the violation, even if people were able to take a case to court in Tanzania, which is extremely difficult for various different reasons, be it a lack of access to lawyers or, you know, the very slow pace of the judicial process or the costs, even if they were able to do that, you know, in this instance where it's the police involved, how is there any kind of independence? And that's why we need to have access to remedy in the home state of the company concerned. And, you know, this is an example of all these things coming together. Um, and, you know, and, and it's, still, it's still going on. That's the, that's the very shocking thing. It's been going on for several years and it's still going on now. Any comments now? <coughs> Philip, please. Yeah, I just um, wanted to add something to what uh, Trisha was saying, and that's that uh, Jen Ruggie was speaking at the, at the sub, uh, Human Rights Subcommittee at the European Parliament this November, last November last year, and obviously he does not have any official function now, so he, is, uh, he does not enjoy the authority he uh, he had before, uh, but he actually reflected on non-judicial mechanisms because he was uh, he was um, uh, challenged on what is going on uh, in this in this case that uh, that uh, well in the, in, the Papu, in the case in Papua New Guinea, and uh, he basically said what what you have said, and he acknowledged that the United Nations guiding principles are actually having a gap in that respect. They fail, that they failed to actually cl clarify this and that uh, he was very surprised in a way how this is being used. So I think what we can take from that is, uh, is actually a clear message to the governments that this is something what could be addressed through the process of developing these national action plans. At the very least, the, the, uh, the, the, the member states of the European Union that are tasked with the development of these plans could... Uh, uh, express their opinion on the appropriateness of these mechanisms in a, in a way that, uh, that you, have, you, have, you have suggested. So if uh, the outcomes of this, of this uh, discussion will be submitted to the Spanish government, for example, or to the EU that is supposed to prepare its priorities and coordinate the work on, on, uh, on this, uh, this, is, this, is, this is a point which I would put in. Catherine, please. I think you were first. Ah, sorry. Uh, well, it was just to say it's ironic, though, because John Raggi, after leaving, has become a special advisor to Barrick Gold um, and has been very heavily linked to the design and implementation of the remedy program in Porgera. So, um, but it's great he said that. Hi, um, I'm sorry, but I prefer to ask in Spanish. It's better for the question. Me gustaría preguntar cuando han estado ustedes hablando sobre todo el caso de Tanzania, de, de Ruanda, eh, dos, dos cosas. La primera, cuando hablamos del impacto que puede tener la sociedad civil en, en los negocios, en las empresas, en las organizaciones internacionales, cuando nosotros sabemos que esas empresas están trabajando en Ruanda gracias a las embajadas. Son las, en primer lugar, son las embajadas las que les abren las puertas y las que crean un puente con el ministerio para que puedan intervenir en esos estados y son los que hacen todo un gran trabajo, vamos a decirlo así, para que puedan firmar un, traba, un, un protocolo de, de acción en ese país. Lo digo por ejemplos reales, cuando estaba en Ruanda, por ejemplo, la embajada holandesa tenía una parte comercial en la que abría la puerta a esas embajadas a que se instalasen en, en Ruanda para poder trabajar en el Congo y lo sabían perfectamente. Entonces, hablamos de de la relación entre empresas, pero hablamos de la relación eh, con gobiernos o que son los gobiernos los que tienen que hacer cuando muchas veces los dos van juntos. Eso por un lado. Eh, una segunda cuestión, 
que usted además ha mencionado muy bien el ejemplo del Coltán, es que conocemos perfectamente dos informes del panel de expertos de Naciones Unidas sobre las empresas que han estado favoreciéndose del tráfico de Coltán y que han, eh, muchas de ellas, eh, participado activamente en la extracción, pero luego en la transformación, en la venta, en la distribución, etcétera, etcétera. Sabemos la lista de esas empresas. No ha habido una sola que haya ido delante de unos tribunales. ¿Cómo ven ustedes también que ese tipo de cuestiones pueden ser, ser tenidas en cuenta si llevadas a tribunales cuando creemos que la sociedad civil es la que tiene que hacer algo en este sentido? Y por último, eh, querría decir, he, no he visto casos fundamentados a nivel jurídico, no, no conozco jurisprudencia en la que se haya utilizado como base la violación de los derechos sociales, económicos o culturales para, por ejemplo, poder denunciar tanto a empresas como a gobiernos en este caso dictatoriales, que a través de la corrupción lo que están haciendo es de una manera u otra tener un impacto en la muerte de sus eh, ciudadanos. Les pongo el ejemplo donde he trabajado Guinea-Bissau. No hay dinero para salud, no hay hospitales, muere gente por cólera, por malaria. Para mí el Estado sería responsable de, y las empresas que lo acompañan también. Y sin embargo no veo denuncias a nivel, sea de la sociedad civil, sea de Estados, basadas en, este, en esta tipificación. Veo muchas denuncias, crímenes contra la humanidad, de genocidio, etcétera, en la Corte Penal Internacional, pero no los veo basados en este tipo de tipificaciones que también podrían ser utilizadas contra las empresas privadas. Me gustaría un poco, y luego, bueno, por último, en referencia a la primera, a la primera intervención que ha hecho, es cuando hablamos de sociedad civil y, y el impacto que pueden tener, consideramos también el impacto positivo, entre comillas, que pueden tener ya de por sí las acciones de la sociedad civil, si consideramos sociedad civil a Greenpeace o Amnistía Internacional, por ejemplo. But yeah, I think, but not everybody in the room speaks Spanish, so maybe. Uh, well, um, I'm sure you could do it better, though. So you go ahead. Or do you want me to, and then if you add, if I've left anything out. Yeah. No, I think the first question was, was about it, so that the, the embassies there also facilitate the access for businesses, and so it's also kind of a complicity. And for the second question? Uh, the, there was uh, several UN expert panels that reported during the um, wars in, in the Congo that involved Rwanda and other countries, and very much showing the links, uh, the commercial interests and the The, uh, the, the use of coltan um, and the smuggling of coltan and the fact that it um, you know, uh, ended up being used by our major industries <laughs> abroad, Apple, Boeing, you name it. Um, uh, and we had uh, the UN listing in a very controversial report in uh, its final report on the Congo in 2010. Two, it was supposed to be its final report, where it listed all those 85 multinational companies, banks, everything, um, and showing it wasn't just these you know, few rogue or dodgy Rwandans or Congolese involved in this trade, but the whole financial and economic system was profiting from the misery of the people in these war-torn countries. Um, and yet, as our friend was saying, nobody, not a single company uh, was brought to book for it. And in fact, on the contrary, Everything was done to sort of, um, um, you know, kind of lock away the reports, not have any discussion, not have a final resolution, not condemn anyone. And it was through that, because of that process, the panel was vilified. And they were sent to go back and re-interview the companies, and then they brought out the the second final report. Uh, a few months later, where the number of companies, European and US, North American companies involved, had got whittled down from 85 to, to about 10, 
Um, and even then, when we tried to file complaints against those companies, using the only thing that the panel had been able to find uh, in the international terrain on uh, corporate behavior and the OECD guidelines, you know, uh, country after country tried to block you know, the complaints, you know, the US and so on. So it's, it's um, you know, you think that that was such a dramatic situation uh, and it cried out for a few exemplary, you know, you can't catch everything. But if you'd had one or two exemplary um, um, punishments or investigations, um, it would have sent such a clear message, but this sort of was allowed to continue. And then the last point um, he was making was on uh, uh, you know, um, using, uh, you know, the uh, Economic, Social and Cultural Rights um, Convention and showing how the corruption, uh, the failure to pay taxes has a you know, direct impact on poverty and deaths in developing countries. And what we've seen now with the bank scandal, HSBC, but we think there are a lot more private banks probably doing done exactly the same. Uh, you know, why, aren't we, why isn't um, civil society using that mechanism more? Um, so I I'll, I'll, won't keep talking because maybe Marilyn and some others want to speak. I just have a very brief comment on, on, on the first question you had because it also, before you mentioned that in the UK action plan, there's something like the embassies should, or the UK High Commissioner should support uh, human rights defenders in that country's um, uh, campaigning for business and human rights. And in this moment, it's all, yeah, but, but embassies also have another function. They have to function to facilitate access for, for uh, uh, the businesses of their countries. And this could be, and uh, this could quickly go into a conflict of interest if there are human rights defenders uh, campaigning against the UK um, uh, against the UK based company then the, the embassy is kind of bit in, in between and I don't want to uh, to make a guess for what they would decide then whether to do for defend the human rights defenders or their own companies so just this quick comment anybody else I think you wanted to comment right um, I wanted to comment on on um uh, a kind of a gloomy picture that we got this afternoon. Um, I was hoping that uh, civil society um, had actually um, gathered more strength and momentum in getting uh, things done um, in a better way. But if people like you, Patricia, are stepping down from organizations, um, uh, this may mean this may mean a lot in terms of um, the capabilities of uh, those two antagonistic groups to speak together and to get to a point where there are actually positive things uh, going on. So um, I'm, I was I was actually very concerned um, that. Um, you know, that would be for you the only way to keep your own, I don't know, whatever, um, <laughs> self-esteem was to step down from this um, organization that you mentioned. Um, the, the other thing that I wanted to ask you is, is, you spoke at some point in your presentation about illegitimate bodies. And I was kind of, I was kind of, um, I'm not sure I, I would find the right word, probably shocked by that. Um, because for me, this is exactly the kind of broad statement that may be totally unuseful. And I personally am trying to get to step out from that and, and try to find ways to actually give back legitimacy to those bodies, because that's the language businesses understand. And so we, you know, the, the, the human rights parties, um, there, mis, there must be, you know, both parties should, should come across towards each other, but if human rights bodies are not 
finding a way to start speaking some kind of a common language, then we are going to keep the situation as it is. And it is totally unsatisfactory, if I hear you correctly, you know, with the examples you have given. So I am trying to, and, and I, I don't have any solution for the time being, of course, but um, I, could, you, could you elaborate on this? Why do you consider, I mean, do you consider those bodies to be illegitimate per se? or because the processes in that particular case were not appropriate. Because if that's the second possibility, then there is room for improvement. So perhaps that's the clarification that I would like to hear from you. Um, no, I, I sometimes tend to get a bit gloomy, but um, I, I, I'm still here and I'm still fighting, so... Um, uh, I think um, illegitimate was probably mischosen, misspoken, um, but I, I think when we're talking about human rights, which has you know, its own history, it's supposed to be victims focused, and it's about sort of um, redressing power imbalances. You know, it's protecting the defenseless against those who exercise power. And in the modern world where, you know, financial flows from private sources far outweigh um, the capacity of, of most developing countries, or many, um, and, and some developed, I think, Glencore's um, turnover you know, dwarfs that of, of Portugal. You know? So we're talking about really big players who, who can influence uh, in, for good or ill. Um, uh, and, but I think that what we are concerned about is more and more non-authoritative in terms of human rights bodies making uh, decisions, say, whether something, in, in the case, say, of conflict minerals uh, and with the Dodd-Frank Act, which hasn't really got a human rights component, it's much more about um, traceability, making sure the minerals aren't uh, sourced from uh, areas under control of rebels or military. Uh, and it's less, and it doesn't really address the human rights or the labor conditions in which the minerals are obtained. So there's been no improvement in the lives of um, the uh, artisanal miners working there, it's still child labor and so on. Uh, and when you go to the OECD meetings where this is discussed, you have a US, um, well, they call themselves an NGO, but they're consultancy, and actually they're very much an arm of USAID. And they are deciding, because they're working with the tin industry, and all the reports uh, from the audits, the private auditors who are auditing this system, and um, whether the tagging of the minerals is, is being done well and if any mi minerals are being smuggled, all of that is quite well covered. But when it comes to you know, the fact that every single mine site in the north of Katanga um, that had been validated as okay by for the purposes of Dodd-Frank and the OECD, is full of young children, pregnant, young pregnant women, digging for minerals in the hot sun in absolutely appalling conditions. Um, and then they said, oh, well, this is a very big problem and it'll take years. Um, uh, so why have you validated it then? Or, you know, there's something dishonest, fundamentally dishonest about it. So that's, so it's more like, that, you know, if it had gone to the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights or if it had gone to the Committee on the Rights of the Child, um, they would have had a different view um, and they might have come, come out with, with some better proposal than the, what's being offered and provided as a solution. Um, so I, I, that's what concerns me. And then with uh, uh, the privatized mechanism, the multi-stakeholder initiatives, or so-called, very few of them are, are genuinely multi-stakeholder. So um, the, the, the private military um, companies, the ICOCA, is very new. It's the newest one, and it's got probably the best laid out code. And um, that's why I thought it was worth working on. Um, and I, my reasons for stepping down aren't 
you know, it's partly it's very demanding of one's time, but, you know, uh, you, the industry is just refusing, particularly the UK private security. They see it just as a competitive advantage. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's been sold, the business case has been sold, oversold. And so to get them in, uh, they've been told, well, if you sign up, no dispute. oh yeah, we said there'd be oversight, but we didn't really mean it. Um, uh, and nobody other than um, this one official will see anything unpleasant about you and there'll be no public. I mean, that's not an oversight mechanism. Uh, and most European NGOs didn't want to have anything to do with this. Um, uh, and you can see why. And, and of course, in many European countries, you can't have private security companies. So there's a, you know, there's an inbuilt problem for the Europeans. Um, so if you can, you know, and, and the voluntary principles has hardly got any real. Uh, uh, um, they've got a lot of consultants because these mechanisms can't function really. So instead of spending money in setting up these parallel and weaker and private systems with no transparency and accountability, uh, why isn't some of the money going into, well, some of the ideas that we've heard today, you know, like having funds that, you know, could help victims go to arbitration or, you know, sort of improve the mediation um, through NCPs, whether you use outside mediators or train a, a group of officials. So there are other more useful ways for limited government funds, and it's very frustrating to see so much emphasis has gone on training and bringing the companies up to speed, and, and I feel the victims have been left way behind. They're still where they were 10 years ago. Do you want to comment on it? Uh, yeah, I will briefly, just to... Uh answer the question about uh, are we very gloomy I, I mean for me it feels like we're reflecting the reality which is a rather unfortunate reality um, I was at an event in uh, Oxford and uh, on, on a panel with uh, someone from a, a diamond company and I you know kind of you know gave the presentation and the person from the diamond company talked about what they were doing and someone someone said and you know I subsequently reflected well that you know there are still so many problems despite the UNGPs and someone said oh it seems very polarized and um, that's because we're still seeing very serious problem NGOs who have experience on the ground are still seeing very serious problems and I think we mustn't allow the UNGPs and frameworks that emerge from the UNGPs to create a means by which irresponsible companies just carry on business as usual, wrapped in this kind of cloud of language that sounds very good, part of these multi-stakeholder mechanisms or part of a code of conduct that, you know, sound like they're moving things forward when actually nothing is, is really changing. Um, what the GPs have done for, for us from an advocacy perspective is given us a way in to talk across government and engage with government and say, well, this is what you really should, should be doing. Um, and just one point to mention that hasn't come up, I think at all, is the, uh, the vote in the Human Rights Council in June last year in favour of the resolution to create a binding instrument uh, on business and human rights. Now, whatever you think about that, it's certainly uh, given the uh, interest in uh, the guiding principles and interest in what real implementation might look like, it's shaken things up. And I was in Geneva when uh, those discussions were going on and state representatives were saying, what more can we be doing on remedy? What more can, uh, what more can we be getting the working group to do? We know the forum, the Business and Human Rights Forum hasn't been very effective and how can we address that? And it did, it did all of a sudden, I think, make them see that people are serious about 
addressing the enormous power imbalance between communities and these massive multinational companies that are having adverse impacts on people. Now, how that will play out remains to be seen. Um, but I think, you know, there is, there's a, there's a huge interest in seeing, well, where, where have the principles taken us to? Where can, where can standards further be elaborated in, in a way that is helpful? And where are there gaps that can be addressed by further developments in international law? So broadly from what, you know, we, just to kind of go back to where I started, you know, the, the question about polarization, that was, uh, that vote was something that was presented as, this is going to polarize everything. And actually it hasn't because there's now a growing, you know, a growing consensus that a binding instrument can add uh, and people are thinking about where can it be uniquely useful and you know, that's a very important development. Thank you. Please, you want to answer on that? Or, yes? No, no, yes, a, a, a very quick Sorry, thought. Sorry, I didn't see you before. And I was, it's okay. Uh, I'm really happy with um, with uh, the, the the things that Patricia said uh, now because she's put it in the center of the discussion. Now, uh, the effectiveness or no effectiveness of the access to remedy to focus on the victims. That is uh, the point because. Every, we, we, we have been spending a lot of time for decades talking about this, and the final goal is obviously prevent the human rights violations and give effective access to remedy to the victims. So the point in the, the question is, okay, guiding principles is, well, for me, it's a good uh, framework, a good reference, put in order dif different concepts, and different responsibilities, but the point is obviously is there. Um, there are not many people knowledge that have have knows about that, and um, very very few is try to implement it seriously. So the effectiveness right now is very poor, and the the victims is growing and is is not really effective. So the point is, how, how can we do that? I completely agree with you when you describe the, the problems of the national point of contacts, because I suffer that exactly the same. <laughs> and I understand that gloomy feeling. <laughs> but uh, I, I agree with Catherine as well, uh, maybe that uh, should be the second reason, okay, that's in, that, in that way that, that doesn't work, what should be improved to be more effective? And, and I, I very align with your message that they know the illegitimate of the instrument, but obviously when we have to face grave uh, human rights abuses, Maybe there's another, other instruments, more legal binding, uh, that should be more effective. Is that the message uh, from my side? Uh, I, I think the all, all the remedy is a system. Obviously, if there are incent positive incentives from the, the binding instruments, will be more effective the voluntary systems as well. Uh, thank you. One or two more. Can I, can I say something about the project of the convention? Because I worked on this a little bit. Um, first of all, you have to analyze the votes in June 2014. And to add to a gloomy picture, this is an additional uh, big stone in, the, in, the, in this picture because all of the Occidental countries voted against. Um, and if you look at the votes who voted for it, um, you have a country like Russia who actually negotiated its vote towards a convention 
with some very bizarre um, quid pro quo with Ecuador and other countries, which we should not be very proud of. So I think this, this project of a convention is starting on a very bad foot. That's my first remark. My second remark, which is a bit more hopeful, is that in fact, I would totally agree with you that that exercise of a convention could indeed make the, the picture a bit better if we are focusing on what I call procedural issues. What are miss the, missing, the missing dots within, within the picture of international law. But my third remark is going back to the gloomy picture because remember, to negotiate a convention in the world in which we live, it's at least 10 years and then ratification is going to take 50 years. So I'm going to be long dead before we see a convention that is in practice. And that is not a very happy uh, future. <laughs> I think that's right, but I, I remember when uh, Don Ruggie, you know, first started his mandate, uh, and that is going back nearly 10 years. <laughs> So he was saying, oh, well, it would take too long to develop a convention. But, you know, it is a process, and it's going to... Whether we're talking just about the GPs <laughs> and really getting that internalised and, and, and finding our way through, you know, well, what's the appropriate forum for this kind of problem and, and, and what sort of skills do the people who are facilitating it need, um, that, that takes... That is not a, a simple process, and you know maybe his magic was making everybody think it was, and so it, this got through. So nobody. Th but I think the problem with the absence of even the attempt to have a binding treaty has given comfort to companies that don't want to change. That they 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 profit and they benefit from cutting corners and not worrying about child labor or, you know, people dying because they're uh, not paying any taxes and so on, or corrupt, helping corrupt officials siphon off their money through these um, uh, vehicles in the British Virgin Islands and places like that. Um, uh, it, then, then their corporate lawyers can come to me and Marilyn and, and other civil society people. Say, you know, nobody you know agrees that you know, there are any human rights obligations on business. You know, we, we so we do hear this. So I think even if there is work beginning on what will be a long process, it will start to redress <laughs> that, make it harder for those sorts of companies or those legal representatives of those companies to argue that with um, as much conviction. Is there anybody who wants to ask a final question or a comment? If not, I would like to ask, uh, would like to thank the two of you for your really interesting discussion and to all of you.